welcome everyone and good morning. Welcome to today's Strategic Farming Let's Talk Crops program. So we're glad you could join us for today's session. We're going to talk about soybean pests, uh, specifically insects in this case today. So especially soybean aphid, but then some of our newer insects that are coming into the mix a little bit. These sessions are brought to you by University of Minnesota Extension, and then especially with generous support from the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Minnesota Corn Research and Promotion Council. I'm Anthony Hansen, Regional Extension Educator with Integrated Pest Management with the University of Minnesota Extension. And today we're going to have Dr. Bob Cook. He's an Associate Professor with the Department of Entomology here at the University, and he's also our Extension Entomologist as well. All right, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Bob Cook. Um, Bob, you can uh, uh, share your slides there and we'll get started. So soybean aphid, I'm calling the uh, the old pest, even though you know we've only been dealing with it for about 20 years, but according to my teenage son, anything over 20 years is old. Um, what I wanna focus on is what, what we've got in our toolbox for insecticides for managing this pest. Um, we should all know by now that the organophosphate chlorpyrifos is no longer available for use. Um, the tolerances for that chemical were revoked, so we cannot use it for management of soybean pests anymore. And then you may have heard recently um, some regulatory news about the neonicotinoid insecticides imidacloprid and clothianidin. And what's going on here is within the state of Minnesota, there is a monitoring program that's been going on for a number of years, and the state regulators have detected these two insecticides in rivers and streams above certain concentrations that are of concern due to um, toxicity to aquatic organisms. So th these chemicals were declared or designated as surface water pesticides of concern back in 2020. And then that triggered the development of best management practices, or some people will call them BMPs. And those were just released uh, within the last month or two. So that's where you may have seen that news recently. And what these BMPs relate to are the seed applied formulations and foliar formulations of these two neonicotinoid insecticides. So seed treatments, and then you know the, the products that we could also be spraying you know, for soybean aphid or other, other insects. And what these BMPs really do is that, that they're providing guidance on how to better follow the label instructions on use of these insecticides and some guidance on how to implement Integrated Pest Management or IPM with the overall goal of reducing the number of detections of these insecticides in surface water and the uh, magnitude of those detections. So that they're voluntary pest management practices. Again, the goal is to decrease um, the contamination of the surface waters so that hopefully the state won't have to increase any formal regulations against these pesticides. Um, as you'll see here, our toolbox for soybean aphid management toolbox in terms of insecticides is getting smaller. So we certainly don't want to lose access to any more insecticides. Now transitioning here to the middle of this table, we've got the pyrethroids, they're in group three. And what we're dealing with there is issues with insecticide resistance. And this goes back to, I think it was 2015. And Anthony, you were actually involved in that uh, research where we documented uh, soybean aphids being resistant to the pyrethroid insecticides. And we've been seeing certain populations of the soybean aphid with resistance every year since then. And we've detected them from multiple states within the upper Midwest and even into uh, Southern Manitoba. We've, uh, one thing we've done recently is going back into our insecticide efficacy data, data from Rosemont in Southeast Minnesota, and then from uh, Lamberton in Southwest Minnesota to look at how the actual infield efficacy of these pyrethroid insecticides has changed. In this case, we are looking at Lambda Cyhalothrin, which is you know in products like Warrior. And in these two graphs, just as a kind of a snapshot of what was what we were seeing, we've got 
the years across the bottom of each of these graphs and on the side of the graphs, the y-axis, we've got the percent control offered by the insecticides. And in the earlier years from 2014 and earlier, we see that lambda cyhalothrin was providing really good control of the soybean aphid. However, after 2014, we see that that control offered by this product under field conditions decreased rather rapidly um, at, at both locations. So this is, uh, you know, some evidence not only to kind of show that not only are we seeing resistance in our, you know, controlled, more artificial laboratory assays and the molecular tests that we're doing, but we're seeing, you know, the, these, um, we're quantifying the decrease under, under field conditions as well. So the next thing, you know, so we've lost chlorpyrifos, things like lower's band due to regulation. We've got resistance issues with the pyrethroids. Keep in mind those neonicotinoids are being watched closely, you know, the clothianidin and midocloprid by, by the regulators. Um, but getting into these insecticides that I highlighted in blue on the table, these are some of the newer insecticides that have become available in the last several years. Um, for soybean aphid management. So we've got products like sulfoxiflor, which is transform, flupyridiferone, which is Savanto, and then down at the bottom, aphidopyropin, which is Safina. And this is just a, a snapshot of some data from my colleague Aaron Hodson down in Iowa. We published this data set and some others um, in a recent paper. And in this graph, we've got time across the growing season on the bottom of the graph, and then cumulative aphid days on the y-axis on the side of the graph. And th those cumulative aphid days, CAD, that represents how that aphid population or aphid pressure is accumulating over the season. And we see in this graph, the dotted line at the top represents the untreated plots where aphid pressure is increasing over the season as we would expect. And then the dashed line represents warrior, that pyrethroid, and we only see an intermediate level of control there, suggesting that there was probably resistance to the pyrethroids in that population. And what I want to point out is that these newer products, um, Transform, Savanto, Safina, were performing just as well as one of the other kind of traditional standby insecticides, Lors ban. So we've got these newer insecticides available. They are effective. Um, apparently, even when we have uh, pyrethroid resistance potentially in the field, so because of that, I think we really need to keep insecticide resistance management in mind so we can preserve these remaining effective insecticides for as long as we can. One of the important parts of this is only spraying our fields when we need to. And that comes down to scouting our fields, getting into the soybean fields, estimating aphids on plants spread throughout the field, and then relating that to the um, an economic threshold. We still recommend the threshold of 250 aphids per plant as that trigger point for deciding when to spray the field. If you spray it, do it right. You know, pay attention to rates, volumes, nozzles. Make sure you're getting that good, effective concentration of insecticide on the plants. Uh, scouting is important. I think in the old days of soybean aphid management, a lot of times we could spray a field and pretty much walk away from it, assuming that that insecticide was going to work. That's not always the case anymore. So we want to make sure we're spraying after an application or scouting after an application to make sure that that insecticide worked. And then if we have a failure and need to respray or retreat that field, alternating to a different insecticide group. So pay attention to those group numbers on the insecticide labels. So now just to wrap up, Kind of the soybean aphid section of this presentation, our management for this pest still relies largely on insecticides. We've got widespread pyrethroid resistance out there in our aphid populations. It doesn't mean every single aphid population is resistant, but, but they are out there. And unfortunately, we don't know in advance which populations are resistant and which are susceptible. We've got some newer chemistries that fortunately are effective against soybean aphid, and I didn't have time to get into it, but some of those newer insecticides are also what we call selective, meaning that they're, they're toxic to the pest, but much less toxic or more gentle on the good insects like the predators and parasitic wasps, which can provide natural control of the pest population. Anthony, I think um, maybe I'll pause there for a second in case we want to 
chat about any of this in detail or if you've received any questions about soybean aphid before before going on to the other insects. Yeah, we have a couple questions coming in here. Um, one I'll mention first is, you know, last week we were actually talking about uh, potential pyrethroid resistance issues over in alfalfa weevil. Um, do you notice on the broader scope, what is it with pyrethroids, do you think, that um, maybe setting up the situation for resistance and in multiple insects here? Um, I mean, one thing that comes to mind, I think it's just the broad use of these pyrethroid insecticides, right? We're using them in a lot of different crops across Minnesota. Um, some of that is, you know, because they, they are, you know, labeled for a lot of these different pests. Some of it may be due to the price points for some of these products. Um, and I think, you know, the more we're using them, you know, on, on any given crop, you know, there's risk of some of that drifting off and maybe exposing pests in, in other crops as well. Um, you know, there could be physiological things within the insects as well, but I don't, I don't think we have time to get into any of that right now. Sure. Uh, another question that came in, um, they're wondering about your slides earlier comparing Rosemont and Lamberton. Um, why do you think that there's a difference there in terms of how it dropped off so drastically? You know, that's, I, we're, we're not really sure. You know, I'm not sure if it's, let's see if I can go back to that. I, I would have almost expected things dropping off faster in Southwest Minnesota, because we have kind of more persistent or chronic aphid issues there. Um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not sure, Anthony. Yeah. yeah, no, it's, it's hard to kind of go back and figure out some of those too, what exactly mm -hmm. may have happened. Um, I got a couple questions also on sort of the organic end of things. Um, since the aphids have developed resistance to pyrethroids, they're wondering about products uh, like pyrethrin, uh, pyganic, and products like that. Um, mm -hmm. What may be happening there? Yeah, that, that's that's a really good question. It's something I've been hoping to get some resources to look into, but I haven't had a chance to. So these pyrethroids are essentially like a synthetic version of some of these natural insecticides like the pyrethrins. And my understanding is that they both work pretty similarly on, on the insecticide, you know, messing with the insect's physiology. So I suspect that if they have resistance to the pyrethroids, they probably have cross resistance to these organic um, pyrethrins, but I don't have any data to show that. It's something on the, certainly on the to-do list to try to try to get some resources to look at. Yeah, that's one thing we talked about uh, pretty often. Um, when we talk about those group numbers, the pyrethrins, they still fall within that group. But yeah, there's that variability with some of those active ingredients where um, you know, there may be some efficacy still, but yeah, no, higher risk definitely, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And right. then that, that'd be a real challenge, you know, for organic growers, right? Because they're, they're already limited in their management tools for that pest. Um, you know, I think some of these organic, you know, pyrethrin containing products, you know, that they, they have efficacy, but it may not have the, uh, residual activity, you know, the duration of control and levels of control provided by the pyrethroid. So if resistance starts, you know, reducing that even more, that, that could really pose some challenges. Sure. Um, kind of two-part question here. Uh, they're asking about, um, what parts of the state in 2022, you know, really were hot spots needing treatment and then what's the potential forecast for uh, this upcoming year in terms of what the winter may have done for us? Yeah, last year was was interesting. It was kind of a, a mixed bag of aphid infestations. Um, I think that had to do with variability in planting dates. Um, you know, some people were able to get in, get their beans planted on time. Others, weather did not cooperate and their beans got in a lot later. You know, so we had that variable soybean growth stages and aphids at different times of the season prefer show strong preferences for different soybean growth stages. So we had that um, working in the background. And then I think the uh, kind of localized differences in, you know, drought severity um, affected things later in the season too. So, so across the state and even within regions in the state, aphid infestations were pretty variable. Um, I'm always pretty hesitant on making predictions for the future about soybean aphid. Um, 
you, you know, as Anthony, I think you presented some winter temperature data relative to freezing points of the soybean aphid eggs. And, you know, I think based on that, eggs throughout a lot of the state were probably able to survive pretty well. But I think probably the maybe a bigger factor will be how conditions line up in the spring as the aphids are moving from buckthorn to soybean and trying to get established on soybean, you know, so I, I think we need to pay, pay attention to how those, how the spring conditions play out. Yeah. Those maps you mentioned, uh, basically the bottom two thirds of the state that we weren't predicting any, uh, major aphid mortality, yeah. um, under 5%. So yeah, no, pretty low on that front there. So we'll have to see, uh, last question for soybean aphid, then I think we'll, Move along here. How about the uh, genetic side of things for soybean aphid resistance um, in the plants? So, um, has there been, you know, any more work going on in that area? So, so yeah. So, pest resistant or aphid resistant soybean has been looked at for a number of years by researchers. Several companies had soybean varieties available. The last time we checked, there were not very many. Aphid resistant varieties available, but there were some for maturity groups in Minnesota. Um, currently, I'm collaborating with the university soybean breeder, Aaron Lorenz, and, and we're we have a project focused specifically on this, trying to get aphid resistance genes into more well-adapted uh, early maturing soybean varieties. Um, so, so that is still a focus of, uh, you know, some of our aphid management research, um, you know, having pest resistant varieties is, is a cornerstone for a lot of integrated pest management programs, you know, for other crops and pests. So I'm hopeful that we'll get there for soybean aphid to try to reduce the reliance on the insecticides. Yeah. Uh, one last point, uh, Bruce Potter chimed in a little bit here on Lamberton, um, where he's based too. And said it may have been just higher aphid populations. So you have still more susceptibles out in that population possibly. Um, sure. So that kind of answers potentially that question from earlier there. There's different populations. They can be spread across the straight or state. And um, yeah, that can vary when we see those responses. So yeah, Bob, I think we'll talk about some of the other new pests coming in here. Okay. Well, I want to shift gears then and we'll talk a little bit about the soybean gall midge. You can see some of the larvae here on, a, on an infested stem. And here are the adults. These are tiny little flies, pretty nondescript, but if you look close enough, you'll see that they've got these mottled colored wings and their legs have kind of a distinctive uh, dark and light banding pattern. But if you have an infested field, what you're most likely to see is the larvae. And these are typical maggot-like larvae. They've got uh, no legs. It's really tough to discern the head end from the butt end. Um, when they're young, shortly after hatching from their eggs, they're transparent or white. And then as they mature, they get bigger and kind of a darker orange in coloration. And this pest was uh, first officially recorded back in 2018. And then it was found again in 2019. And that's when the soybean gall midge was first uh, uh, identified and got its scientific name. So this pest has only been known to science for, you know, what are we going on, four or five years now? Um, and you can see based on the colors of this map, how the known range of this insect has expanded. Um, in Minnesota, there were no new counties added in 2022, but you can see in 2021, uh, through some very extensive survey efforts by Bruce Potter and his staff, they picked up soybean gall midge in, in quite a few additional counties in Minnesota. Some of those survey efforts will be continuing this current year. Um, it's, it's a hot topic. And across the region, entomologists and extension folks are uh, keeping a close eye on this pest. The soybean gall midge larvae feed inside the stem in that upper picture you can see some of the larvae in the stem. If, if you peel back the outer layers, um, this feeding inside the stems causes kind of a bit of a distortion to the shape of the stem at the base of the plant and some discoloration. And um, the, the typical infestations, like I said, are, are gonna be at the base of the stem near the ground, just a couple inches above the ground. 
These infestations typically start around the V2, V3 growth stage in soybeans. So when you've got you know, two or three trifoliate leaves expanding, but the infestations can occur throughout the season after that. And then with the larvae feeding inside the stem, they, they result in wilting of the plant, eventual death of the plant, as you can see in these pictures. It makes the stems brittle and weak and they can snap off at the ground level, as you can see in this lower picture. The infestations tend to be more severe on field edges and especially on the edges that are adjacent to last year's soybean. So this pest overwinters in the soybean field. And then in the spring, the adults will leave that soybean field and move into the um, kind of the nearest, the next nearest soybean field. Um, last year, we had some white mold in some areas of Minnesota. Um, I heard of some reports up by Becker where there's some pretty severe um, white mold infestation. And I bring this up because there's another gall midge called the white mold gall midge that can occur on soybean, but this species is a fungus feeder. It's on soybean if it has white mold or sclerotinia infection. So it feeds on the fungus, it's not a plant pest, but it can be tricky to distinguish these two. So I just wanna uh, walk through a few kind of key things to think about here if you're trying to distinguish soybean gall midge from this white mold gall midge. One thing is the timing. As I mentioned, for soybean gall midge, those infestations can occur as early as the V2, V3 growth stage. For the white mold gall midge, they're going to show up after flowering in the onset of white mold. The location in the field, I already mentioned for soybean gall midge that it's typically on the edges and typically nearest last year's soybean fields. For white mold gall midge, it's going to be pretty much anywhere white mold occurs in the field. And you can see some pictures here of, uh, you know, on the, on the left-hand side of the screen of the white mold gall midge in a, in a white mold infested stem and in a pod. And then the location on the plant. Again, for soybean gall midge, typically it's going to be at the base of the plant beneath those outer layers of the stem. And then for the white mold gall midge, it's going to be pretty much anywhere on the plant where the white mold mycelia can be found. So the soybean gall midge is host range, getting back to soybean gall midge now. You know, as its name implies, it does feed on soybean. It's been reported feeding on sweet clover and alfalfa as well. And most recently, some of Bruce Potter's work in Southwest Minnesota documented it feeding on dry beans and lima beans. And it's, these are in a different genus called Fasciolus, and it's these dry beans and lima beans, or common beans and lima beans, represent two different species within that genus. So it's something that dry bean growers in you know, Minnesota should probably have on their radar screen. Our preliminary data suggests that this pest either prefers or does better on soybean than these other beans, but we're really early on in this, so we, we don't know for sure what the pest potential is, but something to keep an eye on. For management of the soybean gall midge, um, you know, when we have a new pest show up, a lot of times we look toward the insecticides for protecting our crops from these new pests. Unfortunately, for soybean gall midge, chemical control um, has proven to be pretty inconsistent and the efficacy has generally been low. So insecticides are not going to be a silver bullet for managing this pest. Post plant resistance, we talked about this a little bit for soybean aphid. So this is when you have pest resistant varieties of the crop. Um, currently, we do not have any soybean gall midge resistant soybean varieties available, but research being led by folks at um, University of Nebraska have identified some varieties or genotypes with resistance. So that's promising, but we gotta keep in mind that these breeding efforts to try to get those resistance genes or traits into well-adapted soybean varieties is a slow process. So I suspect that it would be a number of years before we'd have any uh, gall midge resistant varieties commercially available. Some of the work that we're leading up in Minnesota in my lab is related to biological control. Um, so I wanted to provide a quick update on some of that. 
A lot of this work has been done in Southwest Minnesota near the city of Laverne, but we've recently got some funding where we got a new student on and we're gonna expand this work to multiple locations in Minnesota and across the Midwest. We're gonna be working in Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa and Nebraska. Um, so we've gone into infested fields, collected soybean gall midge infested stems, brought them to the laboratory to try to rear out any parasitic wasps that might be attacking the soybean gall midge. And these wasps, they're not like the yellow jackets that we see at the end of the summer that fly around stinging people. These are tiny, tiny little wasps that make their living by injecting their eggs into the pest. The wasp eggs hatch inside the pest and then the larva of the wasp feeds on the pest, eventually killing it. So they're their biological control agents. And through this process, we found this wasp pictured here. And working with a specialist on this group, it was identified to the genus Sinopius. The interesting thing is that if you look at the morphology, like the body parts of this wasp, it doesn't match any other known species of wasp. And the DNA, the genetics of this wasp did not match any other known species. So what, what this indicates is that we discovered a new species of wasp in Minnesota that's attacking the soybean gall midge. So some kind of entomological excitement in the upper Midwest, not only do we have a, a new species of pest, we've got a new species of biological control agent. Um, so in addition to the rearings that we've been doing, we've been doing some molecular work to try to assess the levels of parasitism, where we dissect out the larvae, we preserve them, and then we check for the wasp DNA inside the soybean gall midge larvae. And if we find wasp DNA, or this specifically the synopius DNA inside the gall midge, it indicates that that gall midge larva was parasitized. Um, just show this real quick, just to indicate that we were finding parasitism across the season. The different colors on this graph show the two different methods of assessing parasitism the molecular method, and then the uh, the rearing method. Um, what I want to point out just with the short amount of time that we have is the picture in the top shows a soybean gall midge adult, soybean gall midge larva, and then here's that wasp that comes out of the larvae. So you can see how tiny these things really are. In addition to the parasitic wasps, we also wanted to see if there are any predators that might be attacking the soybean gall midge. We put out these pitfall traps in the field, and as these predatory insects are crawling across the, the soil of the field, they fall into these traps. And we found one species in very high abundance compared to the others. So we wanted to see if this particular species, you know, since it, it, it's found in association or it's found in infested soybean gall midge, with soybean gall midge infested fields, we wanted to see if it could feed on soybean gall midge. So we did some laboratory assays and sure enough, it does feed on it. You can see uh, one of the beetles chomping away on a soybean gall midge larva here. And then for sake of time, I'm gonna kind of cruise through some of this. We're doing some genetic work or molecular work to see if we can detect the DNA of the soybean gall midge inside these predators to see if this predation is really happening in the field. So we collected the predators in these traps, dissected out their guts, and then used some of these molecular tests, like I said, to see if they've got the soybean gall midge DNA in their guts. And just a quick look at a one sampling date from one year, we did find some like seven, almost 8% of the beetles had soybean gall midge DNA. So that is an indication that under real world field conditions, this predator is feeding on this pest. So just to kind of wrap up the soybean gall midge section here. Um, this is a new threat to Minnesota soybean. The infestations that we know of are mainly limited to the southwestern part of the state. Again, these infestations are generally most severe on field edges. Um, look for those lesions, those darkened lesions at the base of the plants. If you were to peel back the outer layers of the stem, you could see the orange larvae as pictured here. And the feeding of those larvae in the plants causes wilting, 
and death of the plants and the plants to lodge or break off at ground level. Like I mentioned, chemical control has proven to be pretty inconsistent for this pest. Resistant varieties are not available yet, but hopefully sometime in the future we'll have some uh, galmage resistant soybean varieties. Um, in terms of biological control, we have documented this new species of parasitic wasp. There are some predators out there. Um, more research needs to be done, and, and we're, we've got some of that underway to try to you know, better understand the biology and the role of these insects. But one thing to keep in mind is most of the insecticides that we use for managing pests are very toxic to predatory and parasitic insects. So one more reason to, I think, you know, think about how we're using insecticides for managing any pest to make sure we're, we're using them really only when needed, because not only can we increase the risk of development of resistance to the insecticides, we can kill off these good insects, which can kind of release um, the pest populations to, to increase and cause more problems. So Anthony, that's all I had for soybean gall midge. Um, if you got any thoughts or questions there, you can pause a little bit. Yeah, we have a couple of questions that rolled in. Um, earlier, you talked about hosts a little bit, and this kind of relates to that. But you know, what hosts was it found on before? You mentioned it basically being new to science. So what's the thinking of where did this come from in terms of you know both crops, but also location in terms of being native here from somewhere yeah. else? Yep. So, so again, the, the soybean gall midge was was is, is new to science. It got its scientific name based on collections from 2018, 2019. Those gall midges were first found on soybean, um, and and it's only been reported from those states in the Midwestern U.S. We don't know of it occurring anywhere else in the world. Um, we're still not sure of its origin. It's possible that it could have come here from somewhere else in the world, but for whatever reason was never documented in whatever other part of the world that was. Um, in my mind right now, I'm thinking that it maybe was a native insect. You know, maybe it's always been here feeding on maybe some native legume plants, but no one's ever paid enough attention to them to try to, you know, go through the process of identifying them. Part of the reason I'm thinking that is because we are finding it on more and more legume plants and these legumes are um, not very closely related, right? So we're looking at soybean, sweet clover, alfalfa, and then now, you know, some of those different common bean, dry bean, lima bean species. Uh, next question was related to, um, this can get into hilling or especially this person's asking about rock rolling, especially B1 to B3. Uh, popular for inducing branching, but you get stem damage. So what is that possibly going to do with the soybean gall midge situation? Yeah, so I haven't seen any data specific to rock rolling, but we do know that the soybean gall midge can take advantage of um, points of injury on the soybean stem. So I don't know if I mentioned it, but the, the we see these infestations occurring at the base of the stem because there are little cracks in the stem that occur there naturally as the plants are growing. And then those adult flies, adult midges, lay their eggs in those cracks so the larvae can get in and start feeding. Some data from Nebraska has shown that if you have hail damage higher up on the plants, that the females will take advantage of that, lay their eggs on that hail damage, and you can get larval infestations higher up on the plant. If you've got some other kind of implement going through the field and it injures the plants, I suspect that soybean gall midge could also take advantage of that for starting uh, you know, infestations at different points on the plants. I'm going to combine two questions for you here. It kind of relates to environmental conditions a little bit. Uh, one is, how about soil moisture? How does that do for uh, soybean gall midge adult emergence, uh, if you have any ideas and how that may affect things. And also uh, tillage too, uh, how that might affect emergence yeah. or um, how they're doing there in terms of possible mortality. Yeah, so unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to give you any real good answers here. And that's because this is such a new past. We just haven't had the opportunity yet to get a lot of good data sets related to this stuff. 
If we look at other gall midges, um, they do seem to be pretty strongly affected by soil moisture. Um, you know, so I suspect that soybean gall midge um, abundance and emergence is probably related to um, soil moisture with, you know, probably higher levels of soil moisture probably being better, but I'm sure if you had too much, you'd probably drown them out and cause problems for, for their populations. Um, there is some research underway by Justin McMeckin down in Nebraska, where he's got some more controlled studies looking specifically at that. So hopefully those results will be coming out soon. As for tillage, um, the, the larvae of this insect drop down to the soil and they make a cocoon and pupate in the soil and then the adults emerge. So with part of this insect's life cycle occurring in the soil, um, it seems possible that tillage could potentially have an effect. Um, this insect does spend the winter in the soil um, in, in one of these cocoons. So, you know, at least in theory, it seems like tillage could potentially have an effect, but there really isn't much data out there right now for soybean gall midge. Aaron Hodson from Iowa State is leading up some research, trying to look specifically at that, where they're looking at different timings of tillage, fall tillage versus spring tillage, and a couple different types of tillage. Um, but I think last year in their experiment, uh, the, the soybean gall midge didn't cooperate with them. They didn't get a very good infestation. But this is something I think that they're going to continue repeating. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have some results to um, provide some guidance, you know, in regards to tillage for this pest. Well, Bob, I think we're, we got to keep rolling along a little bit here. I think you have one more uh, new species to talk about here. Yep. So the next insect, it's a tiny little caterpillar that lives inside the soybean leaves. And the name we're going with for this is the soybean tentiform leaf miner. And I'll explain that name a little bit more later. Um, you can see in this picture here, this is a tiny little insect. So if you look by George Washington's nose on this quarter, you can see the adult of this insect. Again, it's a moth. So it's, it's tiny. It's about the size of George Washington's nose. Um, if you zoom in on it and get the correct lighting, you can see it's actually kind of a pretty insect with this orange, black, and kind of silver coloration. And it's got this puff of tuft of hair on its head. Looks a little bit like one of the Sesame Street characters there. This leaf mining insect, we know it's a native insect. It's been reported for a long, long time occurring in North America, feeding on two different native plants, American hog peanut, and you can see the known distribution of American hog peanut and then this other native plant. Both of these plants, as far as I know, grow in forested areas. I think one likes uh, kind of wetter forested areas, the other likes drier forested areas. And in this picture here in the middle, you can see one of the leaf miner mines on hog peanut. This map shows where this insect, the soybean tentiform leaf miner, has been reported from in North America. So you can see it's pretty widely distributed across Eastern North America, as all these uh, states and provinces highlighted in yellow. Um, I suspect that it occurs in a lot of these other areas in Eastern North America that are gray, but it's just no one has gone out and looked for this insect in those areas yet. So in terms of soybean, right, I mentioned that this insect, it's a native, you know, as far as we know, what's occurred here forever feeding on those two other native plants. But it wasn't until 2021 that I heard about it feeding on soybean. And I was contacted by a colleague from Quebec, Canada, and he had seen it going back to 2016 on soybean in his province. In 2021, he contacted me and alerted me to it. And I went out into some soybean fields on the St. Paul campus and down at the Rosemont Research and Outreach Center. And we found it there in 2021. You can see some pictures of the injury on the leaves, the mines that it creates. And then in 2022, just this last summer, we found it pretty widespread across Southern Minnesota in soybean fields. 
and then into eastern South Dakota. So just a real quick overview of its life cycle, because it is something so new. This is a tiny insect, and it lives within the soybean leaves. It lays its eggs on the undersurface of the leaf. Those eggs hatch, and the larvae start mining or tunneling inside the leaf. And you can see the area here that they're hollowing out. When they're small, they make these linear mines. And then when they get to their third instar, so the third larval stage, they produce more of a blotch type mine. And you can see the larva inside that mine here. And then when they become more mature larvae in their fourth and fifth stages, they create what we call the tentaform mine. So that's getting back to this insect's name and tentaform because that leaf tissue kind of buckles up in the middle, it, it gets tented. And these little spots on the leaf are due to the insect feeding deeper into the leaf tissues. You can see some of these little holes where they're feeding into the um, into the meso farther into the mesophyll tissues of the leaf that lets the light pass through from the bottom of the leaf to the upper surface. In these earlier stages, um, you can only see the injury from the bottom surface of the leaf, but it's not until these later stages where you can see it from the bottom and the top. And then the insects form their pupae within the leaf. And then the adults emerge. And we think they've probably got two to three generations per year. Here's a few pictures of the same injury, the same mine on a leaf. We've got the upper surface. We can see it's kind of tented or buckled up. So again, the tentaform part of the insect's name, that's the upper surface. The undersurface, you've got that dried, lower epidermis of the leaf. That's pretty distinctive if you were to flip those leaves over. A lot of times it's outlined by the veins of the leaves where this insect typically doesn't cross over the, the main veins of the leaves. And then if you were to tear open that lower epidermis here, as you can see, you would see that caterpillar or larva inside. And here's just a few pictures of some infested leaves that I found in a field last year from a you know, fairly low level of infestation. Well, actually there's quite a few mines here. It's just that these are the earlier stages of the larvae. They haven't expanded their mines much. And then here's the later stages of the larvae where they have expanded their mines quite a bit. And the concern is, from my observations, these tissues of the leaf that have been mined like this, that leaf tissue dies out. So what that's gonna result in is a decrease in the amount of leaf area or the amount of photosynthetic area. So I think it's essentially gonna be like a, a defoliator. Um, I think for sake of time, Anthony, I'm just gonna kind of skip through a little bit of those methods and just kind of summarize this here without going into too much of the details. But what we've found is that this insect appears most abundant on the edges of fields near tree lines. And we find lower levels of infestation on the interior fields and on edges without trees. So you kind of see that here in the graph. Those first bars are from an edge with trees and then an edge without trees and then the interior of the field. And what we're measuring is the proportion of leaf area injured or mined. And then within a plant, we see higher levels of injury or mining on the lower leaves represented by the black bar compared to the upper leaves represented by that light blue bar. So from just one year of observations in, in, in one field, it seems heaviest on field edges and heaviest lower on the plant than higher on the plant, but the amount of information we have is very limited here. So we're gonna continue our sampling in the coming years to uh, you know, see how well these, these patterns hold up. But just in summary here, this insect appears widespread in Minnesota, you know, feeding on these native plants, but we also found it pretty widespread across southern Minnesota and into South Dakota, feeding on soybean. Like I mentioned, the infestations, at least from our preliminary observations, seem highest at the bottoms of the plants and on edges of the fields, and especially edges near trees. I didn't have time to show the data, but we have found several species of parasitic wasps attacking these caterpillars inside the leaves. 
And again, I didn't have time to show it, but we've done some preliminary work with insecticides and some of the insecticides with translaminar activity, meaning the ability of the insecticide to like to pass through the leaf. So if you were to spray the upper surface of the leaf, the insecticide can move through the leaf. Um, we've seen uh, fairly good levels of control in some assays with potted plants using um, some of these products for control of the early stages of the caterpillars. But we need to expand some of that work to actual real world in-field infestations to see if we can get the same levels of control. So Anthony, that's all I've got for those three insects. I'll uh, stop there and happy to keep chatting with you and addressing any questions that, that folks might have about the leaf miner or you know any of the other insects or that might be on folks' minds now. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, we do have a couple questions on other insects that came in. One is, how about grasshoppers? Uh, we had a grower saying he had to spray for those last year and was wondering, would a cover crop help with that? Or would it cause potential issues there too? So for grasshoppers, I've been certainly seeing more and hearing more reports and concerns about grasshoppers. And I think it's due to the, uh, the number of dry years occurring one after another. And that uh, creates a scenario where it increases the survival of the grasshoppers from one year to the next and populations keep increasing. So I think if we have a end up with dry spring conditions, um, we could certainly have grasshopper issues um they're defoliators eat biting holes out of the leaves um there are some uh thresholds available based on numbers of grasshoppers per square meter or yard i can't remember exactly and then some based on defoliation you know how much of the leaf area has been removed fortunately most of the labeled insecticides should be pretty effective as for cover crops um, I haven't seen too much data about impacts of cover crops in grasshoppers, but I could, you know, envision potential scenarios where, you know, that cover crop might attract in and support populations of the nymphs as they're developing. And, you know, especially if that cover crop were then terminated, it could leave you with a lot of hungry grasshoppers there that might start feeding on your uh, corn or soybean. That, that was planted into that cover crop. So if you're, good... if you're using a cover crop, like a rye cover crop, you know, I think it's especially important to be scouting for insect pests. Um, there certainly have been some kind of catastrophic scenarios where army worms or other pests can uh, build up feeding on that cover crop and then spill over to the, the main cash crop. Yeah, especially Stearns County, my area, we had a couple fields that was complete losses of the fields. It was uh, um, rye cover crop and soybean with the army worms there, at least. Um, yeah, yeah, so and, that's definitely one to be out there scouting. In South Central Minnesota, you know, I think there have been some issues with corn planted into rye cover crops and, and army worms. Yeah. Um, let's see, we got a couple insecticide questions related to soybean aphid. Uh, first, I'll take uh, this kind of both aphids and gall midge. Uh, the newer insecticides you mentioned for soybean aphid, um, do you think those would be okay for the beneficials for gall midge, or would you potentially even be applying those um, based on what we know of on those chemistries so far? So some of the data that we have for those insecticides, we've, you know, through research in my lab and in other labs, those insecticides are less toxic to some of the beneficial insects like the lady beetles and some of the parasitic wasps. So I suspect, again, I don't have the data, but I would suspect that those insecticides would be less toxic to some of those natural enemies of the soybean gall midge compared to some of the broad spectrum insecticides like an organophosphate or a pyrethroid. Um, right now, I don't think those insecticides like Transform, Savanto, Safina, I don't think those are being considered for soybean gall midge management 
if Bruce Potter's on the line, maybe he can. Oh, sorry, Anthony. I'm not sure if I'm losing I you. I think we lost your video there, Bob. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened there. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, right now, I, I don't recall those insecticides having been evaluated for soybean gall midge. If Bruce Potter has been involved in a lot more of the insecticide efficacy work for soybean gall midge, so he could certainly uh, chime in through the, the chat tool here if, if I'm forgetting something, okay? In the meantime, uh, we have another question on malathion, parathion. Uh, parathion is one that uh, isn't used in the U.S. anymore. There are some similar sounding name ones, but they're wondering how well basically these organophosphates are still working for soybean aphid. Um, honestly, I haven't evaluated those in any of my efficacy trials. Um, and I think partly due to the fact that, that they just haven't been very widely used. So I um, haven't had many questions from growers about it. Um, kind of racking my brain here, trying to think back through different efficacy trials that I've seen. Um, you know, the, the organophosphate chlorpyrifos has been very effective for soybean gall midge over the years, but unfortunately we don't have access to that now. Dimethoate, another organophosphate has been more hit and miss for soybean aphid control, more variable control. Um, so I guess I'm just kind of <laughs> starting to blab on here about things. I, I, I honestly don't recall the efficacy of those insecticides, but, but it is kind of variable among the different um, uh, organophosphates. So it, it would be something I could certainly look into and follow up with whoever is asking the question if they want to send me an email. All right. I got time for two more questions here um, before we wrap things up. One is on buckthorn removal. How do you think that can be affecting soybean aphids or what are the challenges both to that and figuring out um, how that may affect soybean aphid? Yep. So if we think about the soybean aphid life cycle, they spend the winter on buckthorn. So buckthorn is an important part of the life cycle. They migrate from soybean to buckthorn in the fall, spend the winter there, and then they move from buckthorn back to soybean. So, you know, I think in theory, it seems kind of simple where if we could remove buckthorn, we could break the insect's life cycle and reduce the pest problem. But in reality, removing buckthorn is not an easy task, right? There have been people trying to remove buckthorn for years and years. And, you know, the, it's a real tough thing to do. Um, and on top of that, even if you could remove all the buckthorn from your farm or say your neighborhood or your township, we know that soybean aphids are very mobile. You know, they, they can fly a good distance on their own, but then in addition to that, they can be blown around on the wind. So we know these aphids can even move between states. So, you could do a great job getting rid of buckthorn, but they might just come into your fields from other areas. So right now, I wouldn't recommend buckthorn removal as a soybean aphid management tactic. There might be other reasons why you might, might want to remove buckthorn. And if you were to get rid of it, maybe it would help you a little bit for soybean aphid, but I wouldn't remove it with the main goal of trying to control soybean aphid. All right, and last, a uh, couple questions on this actually, it's related to parasitoid wasps. Uh, one person's wondering, um, the tentiform leaf miner, did you find a parasitic wasp for that one too, you said? Um, yeah. That one, they're wondering if that was the same as the one that attacks soybean gall midge. Those are different species, right? Right, so, so a lot of these parasitic wasps, there, there's many, many, many different species out there. And these different groups of parasitic wasps attack different kinds of insects. So we know there are certain parasitic wasps that attack aphids, and we find those feeding on soybean aphid. Um, this group, this genus, Sinopius, the parasitic wasp that we found feeding on soybean gall midge, is probably only going to be feeding on soybean gall midge and maybe some other gall midges. Um, that, that group focuses just on gall midges. The ones that we found on the soybean leaf miner, first off, we found several different species there, which is kind of exciting. It wasn't just one species. Um, so those species don't feed on aphids or gall midges. Um, they're feeding on um, 
different kinds of caterpillars and, you know, maybe even more specifically different kinds of leaf mining caterpillars. And, uh, you, just, you haven't even identified all those yet. Um, that's kind of beyond my ability. I sent it off to some specialists at the USDA. So I'm waiting on word back from them about what those actual species are. And then based on that, we can look into their biologies to, to learn more about what's going on there. And this was a follow-up um, basically with these being new parasitic wasp species. They're wondering about basically asking, is it too early to tell if it may harm other plants or humans? And I think you talked a little bit about how these small ones um, aren't even big enough to mm -hmm. sting us. Dentures. So if you want to right. talk a little so, bit about that. So for the leaf miner, you know, I suspect a lot of those are known species, um, but but we just don't know yet because I haven't heard back from the from the specialist. For the soybean gall midge, that wasp that we found attacking that pest is a new species. Um, it should have absolutely no direct impact on human health because they don't fly around and sting people or anything like that. Remember, their stinger has been modified into an egg laying tool that they use to inject their eggs into gall midge larvae. So, I mean, I think the worst thing you could expect for a person is maybe if one of these insects was flying around and it got in your eye or something like, like some, like a gnat or something. Um, they, this new species, it's in that genus Sinopius. And as far as we know, like I said, they only feed on gall midges. So they shouldn't be attacking bees or monarch butterflies or, or anything else out there. Um, they're not going to be attacking the plants themselves. So it's a pretty narrow scope on what they're what they're feeding on. And, and again, it's it's a new species. So we don't even know if it's feeding just on the soybean gall midge or if it might be feeding on other gall midges, including the soybean gall midge. Sure. Uh, thanks again, Bob. Bruce mm -hmm. Potter did chime a little bit uh, in our chat. Um, basically, there are two things that rye cover crop grasshopper question. Um, possibly in the fall, the soil might not be firm enough for egg laying. Uh, but then there's that trade-off, like you mentioned, Bob, in the spring might attract things in potentially. And then also uh, Savanto, uh, it's been tested for soybean gall midge, but not much effect there. So that's one where, you know, may not affect natural enemies as much, but if we don't have the efficacy for the pest itself. Um, that's a challenge there. So Thank I think we, we, we're at the time we got to wrap up here. So thanks again, uh, Dr. Bob Cook, for joining us today. And uh, again, Strategic Farming, Let's Talk Crops. It's been a Great program, folks uh, joining us this kind of late winter, getting into spring here a bit. We have one more session coming up next week. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Minnesota Soybean Research Promotion Council and the Minnesota Corn Research Promotion Council.